One of the most consistent and persistent character traits of human beings has been on display a lot in our society as of late. Certainly, as you look around the country, the last few months seem to have made a lot of changes to things. We've all experienced them, we feel them, we still are experiencing them. And yet, there's one thing that keeps showing its head, and it's this concept, this idea, this character trait of selfishness. What is it for me? I pulled up a dictionary definition of selfish, and it says this, concerned excessively or exclusively with oneself, seeking or concentrating on one's own advantage, pleasure, or well-being without regard for others. That really sums up life on this planet right now. Even in the context of the pandemic and all of the other things going on, what you see over and over again is people's default setting is, it's about me. I think and look in the mirror, even in my own reaction to things and most of the things that have bothered me about the pandemic are really the things that make my life less convenient. And they disrupt what I want. But apart from our individual struggles, this idea of selfishness, selfish, actually seems to drive everything, including our economy. It dominates advertising. It's all appealing to me and my vanity and what's best for me. It dominates online discussions of almost any issue you could find. The people who make the most money in our society are generally those who wind up at the center of the tension the most. There are influencers that make a lot of money just because they create enough buzz that people look at them. And if the goal of life is just to have more and more, then of course that makes sense. If the goal of life is to accumulate and collect and have more stuff and enjoy more things personally, then of course that makes sense. It's interesting because when you step back and watch and you see even the criticism of other people, it's generally out of jealousy or envy. I don't like that that person's at the center of attention, so I'm going to spend my life to tear them down with the hope that I'll take their place. Maybe people will look at me If they stop looking at them, it really happens everywhere. It happens in business. It happens in entertainment. It happens in social media. It happens in politics. And as we see something like that play out, of course, as Christians, we should never be surprised. Certainly, we should never join in that endeavor, and we should never adopt that mindset But the scriptures thousands of years ago told us what our future was, and we're living it out. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, beginning at verse 1, we read this. But realize this, that in the last days, difficult times will come. For men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. I don't have to convince you, this is our world. This is where we live. It's interesting, the very first time I ever taught the Bible was in a Sunday school class at our church in Fresno, and that's the text I was given to teach. That was probably back in the late 90s at some point, 97, 98, somewhere in there. And I had a note in my Bible at the time that I wrote, Paul described America perfectly. And over the last 20 plus years, the description is not less apt, it's more apt. Now, in fairness, if you go anywhere else in the world, it's the same thing. But this is where we are. We're more influenced by what happens here. And when I look at that text, it's always interesting. 
people will be lovers of self, selfish, concerned excessively or exclusively with oneself, seeking or concentrating on one's own advantage, pleasure, or well-being without regard for others. Here's the challenge for all of us. That's not just a characteristic of out there in the world. It creeps into our lives. It's our struggle, even as children of God, which means it creeps into churches. I don't really have to convince you of this. Unless you were saved this morning, you've seen selfishness in church. You may have been the guilty party, but it's here. It's why in the Bible, over and over, we're told to not have that selfish preoccupation. Paul stated it this way in Philippians chapter 2, beginning at verse 3. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. This type of warning never loses its power because we never lose that aspect of the flesh that defaults towards selfishness. In fact, as we draw closer to the last days, and every day we're getting closer, men are going to be lovers of self even more. Society is going to promote loving self even more, which means as members of the body of Christ, the temptation to fall into that pattern of selfishness will grow greater and greater. Now, I didn't just pick a topic out of thin air this morning and decide, I see a lot of selfishness, let me talk about it. Turn in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 13. Because as I continue slowly, as I have opportunity to preach, working my way through Hebrews, I'm in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 1. When I last taught back in February out of Hebrews, I finished chapter 12. And so we find ourselves... At Hebrews chapter 13, verse 1, and this morning we're going to cover the first three verses. And when I began studying chapter 13 again and began looking at things and looking at the world around us and looking at my own heart, I realized that the entire discussion came together. Our text this morning is others focused. It's calling us to something that is the exact opposite of selfishness. And it's a message we need to hear. It's a message I need to hear. Now, of course, chapter 13 builds on the first 12 chapters. And I can't teach the whole first 12 chapters again. But I can summarize what was going on as I normally do. People within churches had come out of a Jewish background, and at least some of them were wondering, did we leave something important behind? Yeah, I, I see Jesus, but what about what I grew up with, the Old Testament rituals and sacrifices? In all likelihood, the temple was still standing at the time of the writing of this book, and so people were saying, wait a minute, are we missing something by following Jesus? Do we need to bring in the Old Testament to add to and of course, the entirety of the book is answering that definitively, no, Jesus is everything. The Old Testament was picturing what would come. Jesus came, it's complete, the sacrifice is done. Ignore all of that. If you add anything to Jesus, you don't have Jesus. He's everything. He is the only way of salvation. And there's deep theological truths taught for 10 chapters. And then chapter 11 is a great testimony of all these Old Testament saints, Old Covenant saints who walked by faith, who lived by faith. And then chapter 12 is an exhortation to us to follow their example, beginning at verse 1 of chapter 12. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And everything in chapter 12 is about running the race. 
It's about persevering regardless of what goes on. And it's about living in a way that pleases the Lord. Where we do have our eyes fixed on Jesus. Where we're not distracted by anything else. And we are running with endurance. And we're not just running with endurance as individuals. We're running as a church family. And we're helping one another. To make sure that everyone gets to the finish line. And at the very end of chapter 12. Which sort of is the springboard for this morning. The writer of Hebrews sort of reiterates what running the race is. He uses some different terminology, but it's the same basic gist. Verse 28 of chapter 12, Therefore, since we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us show gratitude by which we may offer to God an acceptable service with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. In other words, we live thankfully, we live faithfully, and our lives are a service Always in humility, understanding that God is holy, and he's awesome, and we're never casual in our relationship with God, but our life is to be an acceptable service. Running the race, fixing our eyes on Jesus is an acceptable service. And as we step into verse one of chapter 13 as the writer is winding up this wonderful treatise on the Christian life and Christian theology he begins to give some additional practical examples of what it looks like if you're running the race endurance with your eyes fixed on Jesus what does an acceptable service look like and because of the content of those verses I think for us In an unsettling time where so many things are calling for our attention and the world is turning upside down, it seems, it's a good reality check for us. It's a good time of of analysis of our own walks and of our own hearts to see if we're walking in an acceptable manner. Are your eyes focused on Jesus? Or are they focused on yourself and your troubles? Is your life right now an acceptable service to your Savior, or or is your life primarily about your own wants and desires? Really, it's a time for us to stop and say, are we thinking like children of the King, or are we thinking like the rest of the world around us? So we're going to look at these verses, and as I've indicated, they are focused on others. So since they are the opposite of selfishness. I've broken the three verses into a basic three-part teaching outline, and it's very simple. Three steps to avoid a selfish lifestyle. Three steps to avoid a selfish lifestyle, and the first step is this. Practice love towards your church family. Practice love towards your church family. It comes from that simple verse Let love of the brethren continue. Again, this is showing us what a life of acceptable service looks like. This shows us what running the race looks like. And I want to emphasize several things, although the verse in and of itself is relatively easy to understand. Some of the things may seem obvious, but I think it's important for us to not too quickly run past something that looks familiar. Now, love of the brethren, translated in English, love of the brethren, is really just one work in in Greek. I'm no Greek scholar. I took enough Greek in seminary to do what I needed to do. But we have a city in America. We call it the city of brotherly love, Philadelphia. That's the word. Literally, the love of a brother. And in this context, of course, this isn't some type of romantic love or just some touchy-feely emotion. This is a very real sense. It's familial love, the love that you would have for your family. And it all stems from the fact that when God called us to salvation, he made us one of his children, which means we literally are in God's family. 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 and the first part of verse 2 state it this way. See how great a love 
the Father has bestowed on us that we would be called children of God. And such we are. For this reason, the world does not know us because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are children of God. So the expectation is that even though we're saved out of separate backgrounds and separate parts of the United States and in this room, separate parts of the world, even though we're saved out of those different origins and we have different ethnicities, Despite all those differences, when God called us, he made us part of the same family. And not just in theory, but we are supposed to do life together. The expectation of the scriptures is that we will love our brothers and sisters in the body of Christ with the same type of love that people naturally have for their own family members. It's a love that's not driven by people's attractiveness or how much we necessarily like what they do. It's not driven by what they do for us or how entertaining they are to talk to or what kind of things they have that are fun to do. No, it's just a natural love and affection that's supposed to flow from the fact that we now are part of an eternal family. But it's an important thing here That this isn't an overt command, although they're throughout the New Testament. This isn't an overt command to start loving your brothers and sisters in Christ. It says, let love of the brethren continue. In other words, the assumption is that this is already a part of the life of those who are in the body of Christ. The writer has enough personal knowledge of the intended recipients of his letter that he knows they're already showing love for one another. For example, in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 10, and this is just one of many examples in the book, he says, For God is not unjust to, so as to forget your work and the love which you have shown toward his name. And how did they show love toward his name? In having ministered and in still ministering to the saints. So these believers were already showing love to one another. And the writer was in essence saying, excel still more, keep going. And it's important to ponder for a moment how foundational the love of other Christians is in the Christian life. Jesus himself said this at John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So what the writer of Hebrews is saying, continue to do Jesus said, this is the mark of my disciples. In fact, the world should be able to look at us and say, those are Jesus' people by how we interact and love one another. In fact, loving other believers is so foundational that the Bible makes it clear. If you don't love Christians... You really don't have a reason to call yourself a Christian. I'll read one verse. I have multiple verses in my notes. I'll read from 1 John 4.20. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. That's a powerful statement. It's a powerful warning. It's a powerful caution. So for us this morning, as we are looking at these things, we can ask ourselves a few questions. We can stop and evaluate our own hearts individually, but we can also evaluate the life of the church. So let me ask you, do you love other believers? Do you love God's children? Again, this isn't about warm feelings because those come and go. 
depending on what we had for breakfast and what type of day we're having and what kind of week we had, emotions come and go. No, this is saying, do you invest in their lives? Do you care for them? Do you serve other people here at Lakeside? Or are you just an attendee who wants to hear Pastor Steve because he's so good and he is so good? I've heard over the course of my Christian life, which I've said many times, I was saved back in 1993 as a young man, early in my marriage, early in my legal career. But in many places, in many contexts, I've had discussions with people who claim to be Christians, and they said, but I don't go to church. I I love Jesus. I just don't like people at church. It doesn't work. Do Christians annoy you? I'm sure they do. Christians are sinners still. But that doesn't mean you don't love them. That doesn't mean you don't serve them. One of the key reasons to gather together in the body of Christ is to encourage one another, but also to serve one another. We're supposed to love people in spite of how they treat us, in spite of how they might annoy us, in spite of the fact that they're not the greatest conversationalists, despite the fact that they don't have anything to give you in return. We love them because Christ loved them enough to die for them. We serve them because Christ saved them. Our interactions with each other should cause people to say, wow, those people at Lakeside, they're Jesus people. They're his disciples. Not because of what we say, but because of what they see. Now, it's possible that in earlier times, it was easier to understand the concept of family love. One of the attacks of Satan on God's good Creation has been an attack on the institution of the family. In this day and age, it seems over and over families are dysfunctional. So when you say love people like you love your family, a lot of people scratch their heads and go, well, I don't love my family. You don't understand. But in normal circumstances, even in a fallen world, even amongst unbelievers, a mother doesn't have to learn to love her child. She just loves their child. A grandparent doesn't have to learn To love their grandchild, it just is natural. That's supposed to be the case in the body of Christ. You love them simply because they're in God's family. If Jesus chose to save someone, that should be enough for us. You and I don't have veto power over God's election of his children. So we don't have a choice, and it shouldn't have to be forced upon us. We must love. We must love our brothers and sisters in Christ. But again, this isn't just emotions. This is by action. It should be tangible. It should be sacrificial. It should be seen not as a showy pat on the back, look at me, but because it's something other than me in my own heart, in my own time, having a warm feeling towards someone. I already read to you from Hebrews chapter 6, verse 10, where he talked about them ministering and still ministering to the saints. In fact, one of the reasons that we're commanded to come to church is found in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 23 and 24. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful, verse 24. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. In other words, love is going to flow from some tangible action. I won't read it for now, but in Hebrews chapter 10, it's a powerful picture of how even in hard times, they stuck together and they cared for one another and empathized for one another and ministered to one another. 
So let me encourage you. Let love of the brethren continue in your life and here at Lakeside, but recognize that it should be action, not merely emotion. It should be part of the fabric of who we are. And if you're already doing that, and we do in many respects at Lakeside love one another, it's never enough. Keep doing it. Do more. Paul said this in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 9 and 10. Now as to the love of the brethren, you have no need for anyone to write to you. For you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. For indeed you do practice it toward all the brethren who are in all Macedonia. But we urge you, brethren, excel still more. That really is the call of Hebrews 13.1. Now, what does this look like? The possibilities are endless. It could be meeting their physical needs. For example, in Romans chapter 12, the first part of verse 13, contributing to the needs of the saints, practicing hospitality. 1 John 3, 17 and 18, again, talking about in a tangible way. But whoever has the world's good and sees his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? Little children, let us not love with word or with tongue, but in deed and truth. At Lakeside, there are a lot of opportunities for you. There's a widow's work day that we do when we're able to. The benevolent fund on a regular basis helps out. But you can help people individually. You don't have to do it through the church. You can visit the sick. You can babysit a family that needs some time. You can drive someone to the doctor. You can sit with someone during the day. The possibilities are endless and they shouldn't be afterthoughts. They should characterize who we are in Christ. The world should see us, should see Christians, and they should know these are Jesus' people but right now, the testimony of the church is not the best. I'm not talking about Lakeside. I'm talking about the broader church. In fact, when I said we could do a self-examination, part of it was personal. But part of it is looking at the church as a whole. Now, this is complicated because a lot of people who call themselves Christians aren't Christians. A lot of churches don't actually believe in the scriptures. They call themselves church, but they're not, in a New Testament sense, a church. But even allowing for that, Christians quite often are not viewed as those who love one another. They're viewed as those who spend their time being disagreeable, fighting with each other. I read a lot of news because I'm always trying to keep track of what's going on in the world. And Christians aren't viewed as those who care for and love one another. They're viewed as those who are always fighting one of the things that's pained me and I'm sure it's pained many of you about this pandemic Pastor Steve has wisely and repeatedly advised us be careful don't be divisive over non-biblical issues but we could start arguments all over the place by just throwing a few things out over the pandemic we all have differences of opinion but we don't as believers further our testimony by spending our time being angry and fighting with one another. Let me encourage you this morning, do some self-examination as I have been doing as I prepare a message like this. Are your attitudes and your actions, your words and your comments showing love for other believers? I come back to Philippians 2, verses 3 and 4. I could just read it, and that could be the sermon in and of itself. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own interest, but also for the interests of others. That's practicing love. If you've gotten out of balance, you're not the only one. Repent. Repent. 
ask for forgiveness from the Lord, and then resume loving other believers, serving other believers, caring for other believers, as Christ has loved and served and cared for you. So the first step to avoid a selfish lifestyle is to practice love towards your church family. And the second step is this. Practice generosity towards strangers. Practice generosity towards strangers. Verse 2 is stated in a negative way, but it's a clear directive. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for by this some have entertained angels without knowing it. Now, there's an aspect of this that we have to go back to the original context, but when we go to the original context, it's very different than how we live, but don't let that be a hindrance to the application of it. So even though the exact contours of society have changed, this is still a command for us. Do not neglect what? Show hospitality to strangers. It's interesting if you look at the structure and again, I, I hesitate, even my pronunciations are not always correct. But in verse 1, Philadelphia, love of the brethren. Here again, it's one word, hospitality to strangers, and basically it's a combination of love of strangers. In other words, the command is actually to act in a loving way towards those who are not our friends and family. We were just told to keep loving our family, and in our context, that primarily would constitute the family here at Lakeside. In essence, we're now being told, and in addition to loving all the people here at Lakeside, love everybody else that you don't know. Again, in its context, this is a command to act in tangible ways. And in the way I phrase the point, I'm not trying to rewrite anything, but generosity is tied up in that concept of hospitality. In other words, to show hospitality is to be generous towards those who you don't know. Our hospitality becomes an expression of our generosity, which flows from the love that Christ has shown us. And this isn't just praying for other people, although there's nothing wrong with that. That's a good thing. This is tangibly meeting practical, physical needs of people that you don't know. Now again, going back to its original time, a lot of it had to do with the structure of the ancient world. At that time, unlike today, there weren't necessarily interstate highways with a hotel or motel in every town. So quite often when people traveled, if they were traveling for very much of a distance and if they were not very wealthy or an important government official, traveling became very dangerous. There weren't convenience stores everywhere. You would take provisions, but there was little likelihood in many of the areas that you were going to be able to resupply yourself. And the inns that did exist, the places where someone could rent lodging, were generally associated with immorality. And they weren't safe. They were dangerous. So if you were going to travel and you were just a regular law-abiding person, and certainly that would have included Christians, you had to depend on the generosity of strangers or else you were out of luck. If kind people did not see you traveling and recognize, hey, this person needs help, and offer you a place of lodging or perhaps offer you food, for some people, their travels could end before they really got started. So in this context, the original hospitality it would have probably often literally involved believers welcoming strangers into their home. Certainly it could include Christians who they didn't know, so strangers to them, but the use of the term suggests that it could go beyond Christians. It's not just Christian strangers, this would open the door to helping anyone. In fact, that would be consistent with what we see elsewhere in Scripture. For example, in Galatians 6.10, so then, while we have opportunity, let us do good to all people and especially those who are of the household of faith. In other words, yes, we, we help Christians out, but we help everybody out. 
showing hospitality by welcoming in strangers and helping them and meeting their needs is a way to show the love of Christ in a very tangible way. This in and of itself can be evangelistic, but providing a place for people to sleep or providing them a meal or helping them meet some financial need, providing them safety at times, speaks volumes. And even though I realize everything I've just said sounds foreign to a lot of how we live in our culture, it still is in the scriptures and it still is applicable to us. And to understand all of this type of care and hospitality, generosity to strangers has nothing to do with what they give us back. In fact, it's done with no expectation that they can help us. When Christians start paying special attention to people because they think people will help us, it's actually always condemned in Scripture. For example, in the book of James... In chapter 2, there's a picture of wealthy people coming into the church, strangers to the Christians, and poor people coming into the church. And I'm not reading it, I'm paraphrasing. It's James chapter 2, verses 1 to 4. But when the wealthy people came in, the Christians were tripping over themselves to give them a good seat. Excuse me, clear out of the way right here. And poor people came in, they were basically, you just, you're over there, just get out of the way. Why? Because they thought the rich people would do something for them. There couldn't be a less attractive message sent by a church than to do things like that for other people with the expectation, maybe I'll get something out of it. That's a financial transaction. That's not hospitality. The idea here is doing something to help people that you don't even know for selfless reasons, not because it's going to help you. It's simply showing the love of Jesus in tangible ways to complete strangers. Now, of course, in our day and age, it's probably harder to invite strangers into your home. Most people don't drive through my neighborhood on a long journey and break down in front of my house. Certainly, if that happened, you could help them. But we have to be creative. We have to be looking for opportunities within our world, whatever that sphere is, because we all have different spheres, looking for opportunities to help. Maybe at times you can provide a room. Maybe people have out-of-town guests coming in. Maybe someone has a special circumstance. Maybe their house is uninhabitable. Maybe they're in a lurch. You can offer a room. You can offer help. Maybe you can provide meals for people, even if you don't know them, or help someone who's hurting with food or gas money. Certainly, perhaps if we hear of missionaries in town or believers that are in town for some reason, we can open our homes to them. The point is for us to not neglect loving our family, but also to not neglect loving everyone else. We have to work hard because our society is not geared this way but we can still bless others with our service. We can still show hospitality. Again, maybe it's just inviting people over for a meal. Maybe it's paying for somebody else's meal in a restaurant. Maybe if you hear of unbelievers who are hurting, you can step in and help if the Lord has blessed you and enabled you to do so. Hospitality is expected of every believer. In fact, it's such a key characteristic that's one of the qualifications for an elder. If you understand the biblical process of having a widow's list in a church, even widows, to be put on the list, one of the qualifications is they had to have shown hospitality to others. Yet this characteristic isn't just for the spiritual upper class. It's for all of us, every believer, And it's interesting because at the end of verse 2, the writer adds something in, and it's not motivation. It's not do it because of this, but it's an observation that sometimes your efforts to show hospitality to strangers can be serving God and His purposes in ways you never understood. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for by this some have entertained angels without knowing it. 
Now again, I won't read these verses, but in a context where a book was written to a Jewish audience, there are probably two dominant examples of this that stood out from the pages of the Old Testament scriptures. I'll just give you the verse references and summarize, but in Genesis chapter 18, verses 1 to 5, we have an example of Abraham. In Genesis 19, verses 1 to 3, we have an example of his nephew Lot. But basically, these were situations where they saw travelers and they went out of their way to offer them lodging, to offer them food. They immediately inconvenienced themselves to try and help these strangers, not realizing they were actually angels of the Lord. They simply saw strangers and said, I can do something, let me do it. We should be those type of people. It's hard. We get isolated. We get afraid of people. We live in a society where some people will take advantage of you. We're always skeptical. Or perhaps it's just me. We have to overcome that. And if we're serving Christ, we'll let the Lord deal with some of the details. We need to work hard to associate at times with those that we don't know. It's not always the most comfortable. It's not always the easiest. But we have to overcome our selfishness and show generosity towards strangers. Now again, even the pandemic has thrown so many curveballs it certainly makes this more challenging. Can't even... Uh, invite people over sometimes and we have to be careful and I understand that and it's not condemning that but the pandemic won't last forever be praying now for the Lord to open your eyes to see the opportunities that he brings your way to practice generosity towards strangers so the first two steps to avoid a selfish lifestyle practice love towards your church family Number two, practice generosity towards strangers. And the third, practice compassion toward the oppressed. Practice compassion towards the oppressed. We finish with verse three. Remember the prisoners as though in prison with them and those who were ill-treated since you also were in the body. And it's likely from all of the context that the writer is again turning back towards other believers and probably the primary application here is he's talking about believers who are in prison and believers who are ill-treated. And again, the people to whom he was writing had experience with this. In Hebrews chapter 10, beginning at verse 32, he actually recalled that for them. He was calling back what they had dealt with, but he said, remember the former days when after being enlightened, you endured a great conflict of sufferings, partly by being made a public spectacle through reproaches and tribulations, and partly by becoming shares with those who were so treated, for you showed sympathy to the prisoners and accepted joyfully the seizure of your property knowing that you have for yourselves a better possession and a lasting one. So these recipients of this instruction had already been doing it, but it was a reminder, don't stop. And in that day, prisons were different than today. Quite often, prisoners had to have their own food provided. It wasn't given to them in three meals a day. They would probably need their own clothing in that time. That's why we see examples in Scripture, for example, in Paul talking to the Philippians, where they provided for his needs while he was in prison. So remember, the prisoners isn't just to have a recollection of all those people you know in Christ who put, put in prison for their faith. It's saying, help them. Do something for them. Care for them. Be a part of protecting and providing for them. Now, particularly on this area in America, there are Christians in prison, but they're generally not in prison because of their faith. They're in prison because they stumbled into sin. But if you 
live long enough and we get to the point where that happens, then we need to not ignore our brothers and sisters who were incarcerated simply because of their out of sight, out of mind. We would need to care for them. We would need to care for their families. Even now, there are ministries around the world that minister to believers in other countries who are that way. Look for opportunities in that regard. Support ministries who support those who were imprisoned. By doing this, you serve Christ. Again, some mistreatment didn't result in prison, just referred to as those who were ill-treated. Remember those who were ill-treated since you yourselves also were in the body. In all likelihood, ill-treated means they suffered physical affliction of some sort. And since you yourselves are also were in the body, he's not talking about the body of Christ. He's saying you have a flesh and blood body as well. And you should have sympathy and empathy with their suffering and their pain because you are flesh and blood and you feel it. Again, the idea would be we would come alongside them and help them and care for them and provide for their needs tangibly. We don't always have opportunities, but a few years ago, if you recall, one of our own missionaries, Mike Schott, was physically attacked in Nigeria. We had the opportunity of a church family to take up a special offering to offer assistance I can assure you, if you want to know about believers that are ill-treated, talk to Mike Schott. Talk to other missionaries in other countries. It still happens. The point for us is we need to take the focus off of ourselves and our own affairs. Not that they're not important. Not that we don't have to be good stewards of our own personal lives. But we can't be so consumed with ourselves that we stop thinking about brothers and sisters elsewhere who are hurting. The call for us all is to stop looking in the mirror and being obsessed with ourselves. Jesus said the second greatest commandment is love your neighbor as yourself. That's what all these verses are pointing towards. Let me encourage you. Don't let today's scripture, short as it is, and as simple as it is, and for some challenging applications because the world doesn't look exactly the same, don't let it go in one ear and out the other. Pray for God to show you how you can apply this to your life, whether you're a teenager, or whether you're in your 20s or 30s, or whether you're in your 80s or 90s. Talk to your leaders at Lakeside. Talk to your brothers and sisters at Lakeside. Find out how you can apply these truths. Don't be content to let the strong words of the scripture pass you by. I'm going to close with a final thought, but it's a scripture that just leaps out at me. Perhaps some of you, some of you have thought of this scripture But it'll be a warning to some, but an encouragement to others. And it summarizes the heart of caring for others. In Matthew chapter 25, beginning at verse 31, Jesus is talking about the future. But when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them from one another as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats and he will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, the true believers, come you who are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. Naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty 
and give you something to drink? And when did we see you a stranger and invite you in or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? The king will answer and say to them, truly I say to you, to the extent that you did it to one of these brothers of mine, even the least of them, you did it to me. God's praise awaits you for your selfless love shown to others. I pray that each one of us can earn that praise from our Savior through our application of the truth. Please join me in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we at times are humbled and we struggle to know exactly what to do with your word. Lord, our text today, I trust, is understandable. We, we understand what it says, but Lord, we live in a culture that makes it hard at times to even know how to apply it. But Lord, we pray that you'll give us a heart that desires to obey, a heart that seeks to apply it, and we pray, Lord, that you will show us how to fulfill these commands. Lord, help us to show love for one another so that the world won't see people bickering and complaining. They'll see your children loving and people will know these are the disciples of Jesus. And Lord, as challenging as it is, particularly when we live in a time of uncertainty and, and chaos and we have developed a culture that distrusts everything, help us to look for strangers to minister to. And Lord, if things should go from bad to worse in our country such that believers begin to suffer, Lord, help us never forget them. Help us to tangibly come alongside brothers and sisters in Christ and their families if they're being oppressed because of you. And Lord, I pray this morning for those who can't understand what's being taught because they don't have your spirit. Lord, I pray that you would help them understand that they are sinners before a holy God and the wages of sin is death. But help them also understand that Jesus came and lived a perfect life and died for sinners. He died in the place of sinners and that while they can't work off their guilt, if they'll turn to Christ and place their faith in him, they can have forgiveness of sins. Lord, we love you. We praise you and we ask that you will be honored and glorified by our attempts to live selfless lives. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.